Welcome everyone to the QLOG Research Support Working Party webinar for 2017. Thank you for joining us. Today we're presenting the Smart Savvy and Social 2 session. Now back on Wednesday 8th of February 2017, the original 21st century academic Smart Social and Savvy was presented as part of the 2017 Brisbane Research Bazaar or ResBaz at the University of Queensland. Today we're presenting a session that's all about how you can deliver those particular, uh, I guess, slides, tools, and we're aiming to equip you with resources, skills, tools, and tips so that you can deliver a similar session to academics at your institution. So today's session, we're going to talk a little bit about the carpentry concept that's behind the Smart Savvy and Social session. And we're joined by quite a few presenters. Um, the session as a whole, the original 21st century academic, Smart Savvy and Social, was a combination of many sessions that bring together skills that researchers need and particularly need in 21st century. So we're going to be joined by Natasha Simons who will look at persistent, persistent identifiers and again Natasha's not going to tell us all about persistent identifiers, she's going to tell us how we deliver a session on persistent identifiers. Uh, we're joined by Nerit Equatomas who will run through her Creative Commons session. Paula Callan, who will run through Think, Check, Submit. Ginny Barber, who will uh, give us an overview of the carpentry style. Uh, so we're calling Ginny our chief carpenter for the day. And uh, Ginny will look at websites, social media, and also look at getting credit for reviewing. And we're also joined by Sandra Fry, who will take us through how researchers can pitch their work to journalists. Um, what we would like you to do, just a few technical aspects, is if you could uh, just be aware that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, you should all be muted. And if you could use the chat feature to enter questions during the webinar and presenters will address those questions at the end. Now, thank you to those who completed our brief survey, our pre-webinar survey. We just wanted to sort of get an idea of, um, I guess, what people were expecting and what we can sort of focus on. Uh, so in terms of the carpentry style of training, we know that most of you have heard of carpentry. Some have attended a carpentry session. Uh, we don't have any carpentry qualified carpenters out there, which is good because we're, we're certainly not in any way saying you'll be a qualified carpenter after this. We're just presenting how, tips on how we presented this session. Um, in terms of, I guess, the topics that people are least familiar with, we did see that getting credit for review was the one that hit the, um, I guess, the nail on the head there. And we know that a few of you are familiar with persistent identifiers, but that's still okay because Natasha's going to talk through how she delivers a session on that. We also asked you what you would like to get out of this training session. And we this is the results from up to about nine o'clock or 9.30 this morning. So again, thank you to those who uh, responded to that. And we did get quite a few results saying, yes, we'd like to know how to deliver the session. Some people did say they'd like to know more about particular topics. And certainly within the resources that we've supplied um, and we'll refer to the github site as we speak through there are a lot of resources in there and there are tips on how you can find out more but today's session is focusing on the how we deliver it it's almost like a, a mini train the trainer so you can take these resources and deliver them to your institution uh, so again thank you to everyone for joining us now I'm going to hand over to Ginny and Ginny, as I said, is our Chief Carpenter for the day, and she's going to talk a little bit about the carpentry model, uh, which is what the Smart Savvy Social Session was focused on, or based on. Great. 
Hello, everybody. Nice to uh, uh, be part of this. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Ginny Barber. I'm the main job is the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, but I um, also work at our week at QUT. Um, and I have an uh, interest in um, fostering innovation and particularly around scholarly communication, and that's what this session was really aiming to do. Um, so I'm going to just go over really in a couple of minutes what we were aiming to do with this. Um, and also what we um, some lessons that we learned overall and then I'm going to come back and talk back to parts of it that I did and also um, sort of talk about what the lessons were from there. So, so uh, what is the carpentry model? Well, so the software carpentry is a way of essentially a way of teaching skills. Um, it came out of a um, uh, it was developed by an academic in the US who realised that he was constantly being called on to develop um, skills or to teach so, uh, software and to help academics with um, some really basic concepts around how they learn. Um, to code because that was a really under-resourced area within his institution um, and he realized that he needed to do something to not other, but instead of being able to teach he couldn't teach everybody that wanted to um, understand particular aspects of uh, coding but he realized that he could set up a way of um, teaching people who would then be able to teach others and so the whole point of the software originally software, then data carpentry, library carpentry, and now it's author carpentry model, is around not just um, developing content, but also taking it so that people can then potentially go and uh, teach it to others. And there is a, a, an expanding network of, uh, of carpentry people who um, become instructors themselves. And I am actually going through that process. Um, what it is means, uh, as are a couple of others that at QUT and I, they'll probably, I'm sure there'll be many others within your institutions who are doing this. And the critical reason why I thought that was particularly interesting is that it um, comes out of some frustration, to be honest, that I mean, I must have delivered probably hundreds of lectures on open access over the years, um, and it feels like we could probably do a little bit better. So the program was developed with the software carpentry model in mind, um, with the idea of giving people a set of resources that they can then do something with. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we put it on GitHub. Um, now, what we'll do actually is type that into the, into the chat room. It did go around with the invitations and I hope you've got a chance to look at it. And we will actually also look at it just now, but you're very welcome to look at that. And the second model is that uh, based on something we've done at QUT, which is also delivering content around topics to do with authorship, publication, um, ethics. And that is instead of giving long lectures, doing delivering content in really short, sharp um, uh, sort of segments of two to three minutes on some really focused content. So what we're trying to do is break things down, deliver it in a way that people are going to be interested with. The peer-to-peer -peer learning is an incredibly important model and I think it's particularly a model when we're trying to talk to younger researchers um, and I think that one of my aims absolutely is that um, whatever resources we develop gets taken and used elsewhere. Um, and also it has the opportunity to spread into areas that we don't know. So Again, an aim is that it goes to people that we might not even necessarily know are interested. So what I'm gonna do now is just quickly show you uh, where we have the, the site, which um, is, we developed after the, uh, the meeting. So let me just pull this up. So I'm, okay, so just, I'm just gonna scroll down uh, to show you uh, the types of things that were covered and what we did within it. So we were a half session on one of the days when people had quite a lot of opportunity to go to various things. And then what we did after that was that we did a, um, we developed a GitHub. Uh, again, I'm just going to show you that because I'd like to make sure you've got an opportunity to actually look at it. There we go. Hopefully you're seeing the GitHub uh, thing now. Just let me know if you are. Can you just type yes and you are? I can see it. You're seeing it. Fantastic. All right. So this has all our resources on it. And if you would like to um, uh, go into that and have a look at it, please do. All right. I'll stop talking 
now because I, I just wanted to give you the, the, um, the, the kind of the, the overview. And then the concept behind it is it's interactive. So what there is, first of all, there are no wrong answers when people are doing uh, participating in this. It's extremely interactive. We also had a Google Doc that we sent around beforehand that we used to share resources during the meeting. Um, and at the time we did develop, did one particular thing which is very important for the uh, software carpentry model, which is that when people are working, they're on a computer of their own, we encourage people to bring a computer, which is unlike most um, lectures that we go to. And we encourage them to push up stickers on their uh, computers if they need help. And we have people going around and acting as helpers. So all of this, as you can see, makes it much more of a workshop type thing than a straight lecture. Um, Observations on what worked, I think, overall. First is that it was interactive and having the Google Doc beforehand was extremely important. Um, things to think about, maybe we can perhaps reflect on this at the end, but one for me, I think, was that perhaps fewer slides and more exercises were doing it again would be important. And one thing that I was quite frustrated about is that we didn't really have enough actual researchers in the room when we did this. So any thoughts that people have on being able to get actual researchers into the release for these types of sessions would be massively welcomed. But as it was, we had an engaged audience that uh, participated well. All right, thanks. I'll have to take questions at the end, probably, and then we'll go through the rest of the sessions. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Now I'm going to switch over here. And can everyone see the slides again now? They just give me some. Yes, yes. thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, now we're going to flick through. Ginny's already talked about the uh, about the resources and the GitHub site. And I think we, after this session, anything, any questions that we take, we'll um, obviously answer, and we'll also put down on a, a notepad and add it to the GitHub site as well. Um, to continue to add to the resources. Um, next, we're going to actually go into the, not so much the content, but this is the how on how we present it. And Natasha Simons gave the first session in the Smart Savvy Social Workshop, and it was on persistent identifiers. And I know we're, we're all um, versed up on persistent identifiers, but Natasha presented a really dynamic and interesting session and it's not the, the what she delivered but how she delivered it. Um, this is her segment, what's on the screen now, that uh, she delivered and I'm going to flick through to the first slide and hand over to Natasha and Natasha's going to take us through. Over to Natasha. Thank you, Stephanie. Can you go one slide further, please? Yep. Um, okay, so hi everyone. I'm Natasha. I work for the Australian National Data Service as a Senior Research Data Manager. And a central part of my role is delivering talks and training in research data management, largely for librarians and data managers. As well as that, I've got a long history of working with persistent identifiers, which is the session that I gave at this particular workshop. And the content that uh, I developed for it was aimed largely at researchers because that was the target audience for this workshop. But actually, as Jenny said, uh, most of the attendees were librarians. However, I hope they took that information away and were able to, to work with their researchers based on what, what they learnt at the workshop. Um, also, apologies for the egocentric nature of these images. It's actually quite hard to share images of other people without asking their, their permission first. Uh, so these were the ones I picked from, from Twitter, so at least you could get an idea of what was happening in the workshop session. Um, so the main objective of this session was to help participants understand um, the importance of persistent identifiers um, to enable, hold on, I'm just scrolling through something, to help them understand the importance of using persistent identifiers to enable the identification, discovery and impact of their research, which included everything from publications to research data to the software and other things as well. And so to achieve this, the topics that are covered in the session were what are persistent identifiers or PIDs? Uh, how do they apply to research? Which PIDs do you apply to research? Because there are so many of them. Um, which PIDs do researchers need to know more about? Uh, what are DOIs and how do I get one? 
So specifically DOIs being one of the most common types of persistent identifiers in research. And similarly ORCIDs, how do I, what are they and how do I get one? And also um, just a little intro to other types of identifiers like um, how do you identify um, other research materials like physical samples through identifiers such as the IGSM. And I think I did a little intro on the RAID identifier, which is a new identifier being developed for uh, to identify projects. So teaching this session involved designing an interactive presenter script with accompanying slides. So I don't usually script, uh, but I did for this workshop uh, so that it was in a carpentry style, which meant that others could actually take the material that I'd written and use the script and the slides without actually talking to me or having come to the workshop at all. The slides are actually done so they have to be run in conjunction with the script and they can't be understood without it. I used an iPad to load the script so that I could walk around the room and that meant I wouldn't be tied to the podium at the front, which is a bit boring if someone's just up the front all the time. And the style of the session was really interactive. So I think people learn from hearing and they learn from writing, but they learn even more if they're actually actively participating in a session. So if they're talking, if they're questioning, if they're discussing, if they're doing exercises. And this is the type of concept that fits in really well with the carpentry style. So I introduced most of the topics with a question that I felt people could answer from their experience. So some ex an example from the script was, you know, what is an identifier? What are examples of identifiers? Um, and, and people come up with all sorts of things there. And then I sort of answered, answered it by saying, you know, a label, it's a label that's applied to a person, an object or a class of objects. And some examples are personal names, tax file numbers, credit card numbers and so forth. And an identifier can be made up of numbers, letters, symbols, or a combination of these things. They provide a means of naming a person, object, or class of objects so that someone who reads or sees the identifier can work out what it refers to. And then I ask the audience, is it possible to have two identifiers that are exactly the same? It's a little bit of a trick question. Some people say no, but actually the answer is yes. For example, what about personal names? And I referred to the, there's a really good poem by Dr. Zeus called Too Many Daves. Um, when, and when mum calls Dave, all 23 Daves come on the run. So I put that poem up as a bit of humour in the class as well. And then took them a little further through the concept of how disaster it is disastrous it is in research to have people of the same name because there's a critical need for attribution and credit of course in research so you can't have people of the same name who actually gets the credit for the research and in this session I built in lots of questions that were thrown out for the whole room to answer so things like how do you think DOIs or ORCIDs can help you as a researcher and then move through the answers this is how I think they can help you and um, bringing that level of understanding to a deeper context, context basically. Um, and the learning was supported by exercises that involved things like uh, searching the data site DOI service for details of a DOI and to get statistics on a DOI. Uh, we looked at creating or enhancing your ORCID record and we put an exemplar of an ORCID record up for people to use that as a bit of a model. Um, also creating an impact story profile, which you can do very easily now. If you've already got an ORCID, you can just pop it in and create an impact story profile which, in which you can see statistics for your research based on what you have in your uh, ORCID record. So uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. So this is um, just winding up. The lessons that I learned is that an interactive style where people are involved in talking and doing works really well in terms of engaging them in the content and really helps cement the learnings of the workshop. And it's much better than just having passive listening uh, or writing even. Uh, the whole class discussions worked well because it was a small group, but I think it would be harder to run with a larger group of people in that style. And if, that, if it was a much larger group, say 50 people or something, I might have changed that style so that the, the discussions and questions were run perhaps in breakout group discussions. The exercises worked well, but of course we ran short on time and uh, 20 minutes uh, longer would have been a lot better. We had 40 minutes for the PID session, probably 60 would have been better. 
And the exercises always take longer than you practiced beforehand, basically because you know what you're doing and other people have to have time to understand what they're being asked to do in the exercise and to allow time for people to uh, not just understand it, but also cope with any technical issues that you might come across. So I think having helpers in the room is, is really good. And that's, that's also part of the carpentry style that you have helpers in the room. If people put their hands up, somebody can come over and help them with the issue that you're having. Another thing is I think it's always good if you can get a researcher to talk as an exemplar or a champion to other researchers. And I didn't organise one for this particular workshop, but I would recommend it for others. Um, and in this particular session, it could have been something like how I use ORCIDs and DOIs to promote myself and my work, something like that. Um, so finally, I've delivered many, many workshops and talks and even a summer school course. And in addition to what I've already mentioned, I would add that as a trainer, you should never expect to have a vanilla room where everyone in the room starts at the same level of understanding. Because I think everyone has different expectations and a different level of knowledge on your workshop topic. So working from a script alone is not really enough. And the trick is to use the knowledge of the people in the room to lift the knowledge of everyone in the room and to uh, actively contribute to ways of expanding the content that you're delivering. And I think uh, some trainers don't do that, this because they're afraid perhaps that someone might know more about the topic or that they might run out of time. And yes, it can mean that you run short of time and you might go down a few rabbit holes. But in my opinion, it's worth taking this risk because it, encouraging the audience to participate is really the critical thing. And you just need to be skilled at making sure that the discussion stays on track mostly and that people are maintaining their interest in the topic. And you can generally, as a trainer, get a bit of a feel for that, how, whether, how people are responding to the topic. So I think persistent identifiers are a, a bit of a dry topic. So this is actually a good example of where a carpentry style interactive discuss and do uh, workshop approach is key to a good learning outcome. So that's it for me, uh, Stephanie. Okay, thanks Natasha. I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, and thank you, Natasha. And that was that was great. I think those tips, particularly at the end, whether it be a carpentry session or any type of session, are applicable to, um, for us all. I'd like to introduce Narita Quatermass now. Narita is the University Copyright Officer at PET. And Narita is going to talk about her Creative Commons session. Hi everybody. Um, yes, uh, now that's actually the program showing what, uh, showing my, my bit. Um, I had 10 minutes to speak, so I'm just going to show you my slide. Now, that slide isn't bad design on my part, it just appealed to me because I thought it actually is quite a good metaphor um, for trying to talk about Creative Commons in 10 minutes. Um, especially presenting carpentry style, and, and I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I actually uh, did. But in summary, I think 10 minutes in a way, I think a face and an introduction is a good use of 10 minutes. But I decided it would be appropriate to do a little bit of a hands-on exercise, but backed up um, with a reusable document that I shared. Um, with everyone on GitHub, and in fact, I'm sharing with you all um, today as well. Um, so, my objective in the session is that um, Creative Commons licenses, well, copyright and licensing are central to any discussion on open access, um, but working uh, for Creative Commons, I think uh, I pick up that it, it's actually often not on the radar. Um, Perhaps because open access, people often think of it in terms of published journals, but we're talking about many more research outputs than just what goes into published journals. So I think people need to understand how the licenses work for themselves and the practical aspect of licensing their outputs that are being published in journals, where licensing is just part of the publishing process it's taken care of. So the, the session was really designed to show people how very easy it is to select a license using Creative Commons license choose tool and to actually put that mark 
on a work. So as I said, to achieve that, I made the session hands-on. I created a document that had some basic background information to speak to about Creative Commons um, with a little hands-on task at the end. I shared the document on GitHub so that people could also interact with it live during the workshop. That's a good time saver, so you don't have to be showing people where to go and how to get there. So all I had to do was have the document open and to click on the links. There were three steps. You'll see um, if you go and have a look at my actual document, um, there were just, um, there were five bullet points um, to the hands-on. Um, we ran out of time. And I think that's okay because I felt that the fact that people had something that they could take with them that was reusable, um, that was reusable because it was in fact open licensed using a CC license was both an example and then a working document for the future. Um, as Natasha has highlighted, I think when you have engagement in the room, that's the most important thing to pay attention to. We had questions and there were people talking and sharing comments. And I think if you make those um, the focus, then you really can't go wrong. Um, and as I said, if people decide that, and most of the people in the session were in fact library staff, I think would be probably offering training to researchers. If you have something that they, they can work on, modify to suit their purposes, then that's quite a good carpentry. Um, outcome. And that's all from me and, and I'll welcome your questions later if you have any. Thanks Narada. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Paula Cowan, Scholarly Communications Librarian here at PET and Paula is going to talk about the Think Check Submit session which followed up on Creative Commons. Okay, thanks Stephanie. So the main objectives for my session were to help participants understand the importance of incorporating quality checking into the process when choosing where to publish their research. And so um, we decided we would build this around the Think, Check, Submit framework. So to um, the preparation, uh, so to achieve this, the session covered the following topics. So an overview of the Think, Check, Submit framework, the key points to consider um, when shortlisting potential journals, the tools which could be used to identify candidate journals within a subject area, and the tools which could be used to um, assess or verify journal quality. And as with the um, other presentations, we all prepared a document that was shared by Google Docs that they would have on the screen when they came into the room and they would be able to click on those links to go to the particular tools. So um, I'll come back to that in a moment. So in terms of preparation, obviously um, you need to um, decide which tools you're going to focus on because in a short period of time, you can't um, have too many tools uh, to go and, and, and cover. Um, and then creating the slides and the draft script so that um, you know that it's going to fit within the time frame. Also, I found that I really needed to, to practice that to, to check because there's always too much and you've got to cut stuff out and work out. And that helps you refine it down to um, what are the most important things to cover. Um, I also thought it was good to think up some draft, um, some questions to ask. Um, and obviously um, you've got to play it by ear depending on the audience participation but it's really good to think ahead and, and have some ready and some probes to um, to develop what they come up with in terms of the session delivery um, I decided to start with the think check submit video which is only about two minutes about two minutes long because this provides a really um, succinct overview um, and so that leaves you more time then to go into looking at the tools. And so the learning was supported by the activity in which, uh, which involved using one or more of the tools to find a journal in, um, a, in the, a subject area that was relevant to their research. 
um, and that could be either the um, Simago shape of science, which is a really interesting visualization where you can move the mouse over the subject areas. Um, yeah. And then drill down into a subject area or even the cusp between two subject areas to find particular journals. Or they could use the, um, the, the um, Simago to, to look within the subject categories. And then uh, we looked at some of the tools for assessing quality. And there we looked at both the Scopus Journal Analyzer and also the DOAJ. So within the Scopus Journal Analyzer, they could compare two or three journals on a particular topic. They're all on the same topic and look at the, the different um, metrics to, to assess the quality. And within DOAJ, we looked at uh, drilling down to journals that have actually got the DOAJ seal, which means they're the, uh, they've been assessed in terms of their, their quality. The lessons that I took away from delivering this session is that it is terrific to have hands-on engagement um, within the session. Um, and having the document on the screen that helped people get to the tools I thought was really good because no time was lost trying to actually um, get people to the particular tools. And also the post-it notes I thought were terrific so that um, we could see at a glance if someone had lost um, that needed a bit of help. So they could put up the, the pink post-it note on their screen and discreetly someone would notice and come over and give them help because people um, disengage quite quickly if they get lost. In terms of what I would do differently if I was running the same session again now, I'd probably include the journal citation reports at the moment because um, given that that's being used, uh, that the Clarivate is being used in ERA, um, I think that there would be a lot of interest in, in using that. And um, I think I'd also work into the plan um, a suggestion for creating a publishing plan at the outset, uh, as well as using the framework so that they can actually use that to guide what they're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. And remember, if you have any questions, if you can uh, enter them into the Q&A area, and we'll address them at the end of the session. I'd like to introduce uh, Ginny back to the um, speaking chair. And Ginny's going to talk through her session on working with websites. Right, hello again, everyone. So I am, um, I'm, we had a couple of objectives um, in the, this session, which was about essentially trying to encourage academics to um, use their websites um, to promote their work, but also use other types of social media. So this session covered, um, this section covered uh, working with Twitter and it also covered working uh, with websites. And we talked um, both about some really standard tools that are out there and also talked about some other possibilities that they might uh, want to go through. Um, so I guess the main objectives here were, uh, we know that um, quite a few academics do tweet and some of them do it extremely well, but there's also quite a lot of academics that are quite unfamiliar and don't feel comfortable with doing it. So the idea was to raise awareness and to get them thinking about how they might use it for their own personal research. Um, it was also the idea of trying to um, give them the idea that there's more than one option. So sometimes people think, well, I'm not very good at Twitter, I could, could, but I can write really reasonably well, so I can do perhaps longer things. So the idea that you don't have to stick for to one tool, you can try a variety of tools, um, whichever suits your way of going through. Um, what we did um, initially was to sort of look at some examples of what, who were really great tweet, tweeters. Um, and I'm sorry to say that Donald Trump was up there as uh, somebody who does seem to have rather mastered how to use Twitter for his own uses. But um, closer to home, we had a rather nice example of Maggie Hardy, who's a, uh, an academic who works on spiders at UQ. Um, she's also a great public speaker and she does broadcasts and she uh, tweets incredibly effectively about her work in a way that's really scientifically rigorous, but also really um, you know, entertaining. So that's a good um, uh, model, I think. 
Um, we tried to give them some, some examples of things they might think about. And you know, one of my pieces of advice is that when you're people are tweeting, they need to try and just kind of know who they are. And that sounds like a slightly odd thing, but understand whether you're tweeting on behalf of your organization or yourself, or you know, if it's going to be misconstrued um, as being somebody else's opinion, you need to be utterly clear about that. I think that's where a lot of anxiety happens. Um, and also just reinforcing one of the things that we do know around kind of the permanency of these types of things and the, the need to, um, you know, perhaps be adventurous, but also to be uh, aware that what they put up there is, you know, could potentially come back to haunt them in, in later times. Um, we then went through just some examples of what were good tweets um, and uh, we had some examples of those up on the screen. Again, I used quite heavily the example of local academics and I think that uh, that's quite important rather than picking people from the, that they may not have any familiarity with. We picked examples, this was because the talk was at, it was at, uh, at UQ. Um, we picked academics from, from QUT, UQ, other related, uh, local organisations that people might be familiar with. Um, and then at the end of that bit, we went on and, and had suggested people have a go at writing some tweets. Um, so I guess from this particular one, I would say that uh, really it was much that little first section was much more a, a more traditional type of, I guess, uh, expedition of, of what the issues are. Um, there wasn't too much that was interactive at that particular point. Um, as came up earlier, I think uh, Natasha said, it is important to remember there may well be extremely experienced people in your audience that may be fantastic, you know, users of social media and the idea of using them if they'll, if they'll out themselves is fantastic because then you can build on that. Um, and I was really keen to do that. And I, but I think in retrospect, we, you know, a little bit more time to do that would be great. Um, and then the second bit was around blogs and we talked about that. Um, again, we talked about some really good examples of uh, where blogs are incredibly valuable and so the conversation is one that comes up quite a lot. There's examples such as the machinery of, machinery of government, which I talked about, which is based at Griffith, um, and then some uh, uh, other local relevant blog sites. And again, you know, some basic reminders about, you know, the need to think about who you're writing for, who, who you are when you're writing, and uh, the, the permanency of what you write. Um, and we encourage them right at the end of that section to have a go at writing an, a blog introduction. Um, and I think a few folk did it, but it, we did kind of run out of time. There was quite a lot of uh, uh, discussion in this part, and uh, we felt like in the end, you know, it's quite a complex thing to ask people to write um, some thoughtful text on their research. And um, I think probably that could have been a longer longer session. We also talked about uh, platforms for, for publishing and so up on the site there you can see we suggested if you do want to, people want to start thinking about setting up their own blogs there are some places that they can go to and have a look around at best practice um, not being prescriptive about what the particular um, areas were that particular sites that they might use but encouraging people to experiment. Um, Okay, so that's my that's my part on websites and social media. Okay, um, well, I'll stay yeah, there, Jenny, Jenny because <laughs> that's what Jenny yeah. then presented the next session, uh, which was on how to get credit for your peer review activities. Yeah, and so again, this one really was the idea here was to introduce some concepts to the group that they may not have thought about before, to really suggest to indicate there's some. It's real innovation going on all across scholarly communication, and that ties in with the whole theme about ResBAS, really, which is that it's not just trying to do what you do now the same way or a little bit better. It's actually that there are some really fundamental changes happening in publishing, and so encouraging them to uh, think about what's out there and uh, ideally to have some discussions about that. So the ones that we focused on um, were Publons and Academic Karma. Um, Publons is the site where you get credit for doing peer review and you can you can provide a, a list of all the places, all the peer reviews you've done with as much detail as you want. Um, and that's being used by some universities for academic credit. So an example of that would be UQ. Um, academic Karma is a slightly different uh, initially started out more on the idea of giving credit, but now has moved into um, managing uh, or encouraging peer review of preprints. Um, and we did also talk about uh, preprints, and I've provided a link there to some of the preprint sites that are up there. Um, 
So what was interesting about this session is that I think that, uh, so we encouraged them to go and have a look at uh, what was out there. Um, we encouraged them to, we show, I did some, uh, pulled up some screenshots of um, the types of uh, uh, information that you can get, for example, from Publon. So they provide lists of universities that have got uh, 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 high numbers of reviewers and you can click in and see you know how people at your university are reviewing and you can see what your publishers are doing and you can also see things like how this ties up with ORCID so this was a real a good opportunity to remind people that the importance of ORCID and the importance of um, if you're going to venture into these new types of um, publishing areas that you want to be sure that you've got some really cool things in place in one of those is orchid so it's a nice way to be able to to recognize that um, I think that in looking back at what we talked about now it's quite interesting because actually both of there have been some quite fundamental changes with both Publons and Academic Karma. So Publons actually has been has been sold since that time so um, to a it was always a small startup but it's now been sold to a sort of rather rather bigger organization and there's a big question about uh, what will happen to people's information within that so I think it, it this gives an, an interesting example of perhaps cautions that you have to say to people that um, except if you're willing to experiment that's great but also just be aware of the fact that uh, things do change so and that comes back to the role of the library I think being across all of these types of things and again academic karma has, has changed several times during its lifetime is what it, into what it does so um, if you're providing advice to academics or if you encourage ac academics to uh, look at these types of things they also do need to be aware that uh, they, they won't necessarily be static products as it were some of that's good but you know we also need to be aware of that um, so again we uh, encourage them to go and have a look at them we also uh, we did try to do some interactive things, so having a look, for example, at preprint sites, um, suggesting ones that they might consider doing a review themselves on, and looking at how they might do that via academic karma was one. Um, with Publons, we looked at that and said to uh, in, show the um, page of how you sign up, um, and suggested that if people wanted to, they could go on and link some activities that they had there, if that's appropriate. So. Again, coming back to this idea of uh, showing people what they could do was a real core part of the whole day I, with active sites where it was relatively easy, to be honest, for them to be able to sign up online. Okay, so that's that was really that part. And I think if we were doing it again now, there's probably a few other things we'd also pull in. So these activities and uh, oh, these are these things are not static in this whole area. Thank you, Ginny. And now our last speaker uh, is Sandra Fry, and Sandra is a library advisor with the business team, PT Library, and I'll hand it over to Sandra. She's going to talk about how to pitch, um, or how researchers can pitch their research to journalists. So I used to be a journalist at the ABC uh, here in Brisbane, and I'm going to talk today about identifying research uh, which may have a broader appeal, so not just sticking to scholarly and academic journals, getting out into the mainstream media. So uh, I want to talk to you about encouraging your researchers to, to look that bit further. So as academic librarians, we have a real opportunity to see research often before it's published and often um, before anybody else gets to see it. So we should be able to use that um, we're in a good position to use that research and, and see it before publication. Talk to researchers and um, assist them and help them by engaging with them about some questions um, in their research directly. So we should be asking them why they're doing this research, what's prompted uh, them to do this particular part of research. We need to ask them um, what they're hoping to achieve from this research we need to ask them why this particular piece of research is important. We need to find out whether they're just filling the gap in this research. And from there, we can determine whether or not it's going to be newsworthy. If they are just filling a gap in their research, it's unlikely that it's going to be newsworthy in the mainstream. But while there's no definitive guide to what is and what isn't newsworthy, um, I can give you a few tips. And as the old saying goes, it's not news when a dog bites a man, but it is news when a man bites a dog. And so we, we go for things which are unusual or new 
more exciting. So firstly, journalists look at human interest stories. So stories or research which have broad appeal, things which get people's emotions working, things which tug on the heartstrings. Uh, stories about famous people or links to famous people. Uh, for example, imagine a, a, a marine biology researcher who's been doing research on a stingray's defense system. Can you imagine the difference that research would have provided um, before Stephen Irwin's death and after Steve Irwin's death? So the human interest in that sort of research would have improved greatly uh, afterwards. Another part of uh, newsworthiness is proximity. Uh, you'll see on the news there may be a 45 second story uh, about a, a, a terrible earthquake in China uh, with hundreds of people dead, but there might only be a four minute story on you know, traffic problems on the Story Bridge or on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So proximity is what journalists use to determine what their audience and what they think their audience would be more, uh, more likely to be interested in. And, um, and that's why you get the big change between the, the uh, length of stories on issues that are, that are often sort of out of our realm of general understanding. Uh, timeliness is another issue, and it ties back to that Steve Irwin story example that I gave you. So a story about a new system of measuring climate change is more likely to be more newsworthy at a time of, of um, major drought or at a time when there is a lot of uh, a heat wave or, or some sort of other extreme weather event. And lastly, lastly, significance or big picture issues. So that would be like major elections or big sporting matches, major scientific breakthroughs, things which affect most people. So how do you determine this as an academic librarian? Well, I'd urge you to think about talking to your researchers about these questions. Get them to determine the goal of their research. Where, where does this research go? Are they just um, doing something that can, can uh, provide a gap, like I said earlier, or, or is the ultimate goal of this spinal research in getting people to walk again? So you really need to determine what the potential end goal is. Um, and most importantly, urge them to think about how their findings can help the community or individuals, how their findings can contribute to the area of expertise, how they can contribute to make society better, how they can shake up the way things are, are done currently, how their findings can contribute to current issues in society and, and assist, and how their findings could challenge long-term beliefs or things that have been held or norms for a long time. So if researchers can articulate this information to their friends and their family and to you, they should be able to articulate, articulate it to a journalist uh, effectively. And in the session that we ran in February, uh, we had some researchers in the room and we asked them to pitch their uh, research to me so I could determine whether or not it would be something that as a journalist or as a former journalist, I would, uh, I would be able to put or get onto a media. Uh, outlet or, or to take it a little bit further into the mainstream and most universities have uh, as you know media people or a media communications unit and this is a tool that I think is often underutilized and you can bring those people in and do a similar thing get them to come in and get researchers to pitch to people in those media they're all usually experienced journalists and get them to come in and, uh, and, and see whether or not they think that there is some sort of newsworthiness to that research in particular. And that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. And just a reminder that we have all the resources that we used in the session on the GitHub site. And we would like to now hand it over to questions from you. And although we haven't got any questions now, but um, does anyone have any burning questions they'd like answered by our presenters? And Natasha is ready to answer questions also. Now, most of us, you have probably gathered, are in the room here, and Natasha's over at the University of Queensland. Or is there anything else that our presenters would like to add? Um, 
again, we'd like to stress that we weren't um, aiming to give the content of the session today, but just to give tips um, on how people can present it. And I know one of the things that came through was that we always run out of time. And um, I think we all said that's not a bad thing because you're usually running out of time because people are engaged and they're um, involved in what they're doing and questions come about. Uh, and I guess, yeah, does anyone want to add anything to that? And uh, to Ginny? Um, I, I'm going to, uh, I'll echo something that Natasha said actually, which is that I, I don't tend to script my talks when I give them, partly because, you know, you often give the same thing quite often. Um, it was actually really useful to script it in this occasion. Um, and if that means that maybe when you uh, put the resources up online, you have to have the script and the, the slides, that's perhaps a little bit of a disadvantage. But it was immensely helpful to script, I think, and it allowed us to actually get quite a lot in in, uh, in a way that we perhaps wouldn't have been able to before. So um, I've also, if you're thinking about doing this, I absolutely would not underestimate the amount of time it took to do it. I think that, um, I think Belinda and Natasha and I got together possibly about six months before to start thinking about it. Um, there was a lot of back and forth beforehand. We had our own Google Doc that we planned it all out with. Um, we were pretty careful about what we knew, pretty much what we were going to do and who we were going to ask um, early on. Um, but then actually getting that all teed up was a, was a fairly, fairly large bit of logistical work. So if you're thinking about doing this, if you're one a particularly great place to do this, this type of thing is at ResBAS. So if that's coming to a resource place to you, near you soon, do it. But start thinking about it. You know, a good few months out. That was uh, uh, that would be my main piece of advice to folks. Yeah, can I just add to that? Just in terms of the <clears throat> the content as well. I think we thought that we this was also a little bit of a trial, wasn't it, Ginny? We just wanted yep. to see how people responded to it and and whether it was something that people wanted. To come to or not um, and I think in terms like we could have actually expanded the content of that workshop as well uh, so I would have liked to have added a research data part of that obviously that's part of being smart savvy and social is managing and, and sharing your data um, but I'm sure there was other uh, modules we could have added on but uh, like you said actually Ginny as well things change really quickly in this space in all of the topics we talked about actually so uh, it's something where you can't just sort of do it once and then there's the script and do it again over and over but you can use that as a real basis for um, I guess uh, taking what you think is really useful and adapting it and changing it uh, to suit the particular needs of the of the time and where you're doing it yeah okay Thanks, Natasha. Are there any other comments from other speakers here in the room? We still, we haven't got any questions. So no, they're all in the chat window, Stephanie. Oh. There's, there's like about five or six questions there. Thanks, Natasha. Maybe I'm, we're not seeing it. We've got a... Okay. Do you more. want me to read them out? Okay. Um, here we are. You've got them. You've got them? Yeah. Okay. Now we're all far away. Um, We'll, we'll go from the bottom down, or should we? We'll see what's actually. We'll go right up to the top again. Great, great, great. Uh, if you go to the bottom, I think it starts with Jackie Wollstoneholm. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the boring question. I missed the first couple of minutes. Can you tell us again what the GitHub site is? Might hand over to Ginny while yeah, she's sure. talking. Yeah, I'll get it up. Yeah. yeah so the GitHub site, Jackie, is where we, uh, which you should be seeing on the screen now. It says the 21st century academic smart savvy and social, and it has the various tabs across the top. Hope you can see. Um, so essentially, that was something a resource that we put up after the um, after we delivered it with all the slides that we had. Uh, done and also just a sort of outline of each of the sessions. So um, oh, the principle around the GitHub is that anyone's welcome to take it. Uh, you you uh, you can't you can't adapt this one yourself. I mean, on, on this particular page, but you can take it, put it on your own GitHub site, and uh, do whatever you like with it. It's all CC by. Um, so we appreciate being uh, acknowledged as the source of it, but you're very welcome to adapt and use the tools and the text that come from it. Uh, our next question is about Publons, and maybe while Ginny's there, 
I'll look at it more closely. However, it appears to focus on the science. So it's uh, social yeah, so it absolutely it absolutely does cover the so, so sciences. It's it's essentially for all academic publishers. So um, have a look at it. You'll see a wide range of um, um, a wide range of journals. That, I mean, for example, Wiley has basically signed up all its journals. So absolutely, maybe we'll be seeing that more people in the sciences are more willing to uh, you know participate, but it, it's not limited at all. Um, our next question is about carpentry method and just a few brief dot points. Yeah, well, the, I sort of covered this briefly at the beginning. So this is essentially the idea of, that people um, learn to, learn, uh, essentially it's peer-to-peer -peer learning. So um, at your, you teach a, a, a topic, say um, data management, um, and then uh, anyone can go away and use that in their own work um, and they can um, ideally then get trained in it and then teach other people. So it's not, it's uh, essentially a way of, instead of uh, standing up in front of people and just delivering lectures that uh, have no way of passing on, that they can, it's a way of uh, allowing people to have the tools that they can use in their own work, but also um, go on and teach afterwards. And it's, uh, there's actually a very, uh, there's a large community around it now, and so there are some really important concepts within it because you know you can imagine it's a fairly geeky community, and um, it like many some, like some communities like this, they can they, the uh, the culture within it might be difficult for people that are new to it. So there's some really important principles, including such things such as you know you do not humiliate people if somebody says. Oh, you know, what's a preprint? You don't roll your eyes and go, oh, I can't believe you don't know what a preprint is. You know, it's about being very uh, respectful of everyone who's in the room um, and assuming that you, you know, not assuming knowledge and not uh, uh, doing, not sort of in, expecting people to learn at a particular speed as well. So that's where things such as the having ways of people attracting attention through the um, the post-it notes which you post on your computer about whether you've got whether you're following on okay or whether you need help um, are, are very important so uh, I can certainly post something about that in the um, afterwards and if you google it you'll see there's a vast amount on it and then just to go back to author carpentry is a is essentially a t taking some of that um, method of learning and applying it to not just things around software and data but also around other tools that authors need so things such as understanding copyright and understanding open access it's been developed by um uh, Calte uh caltech i think that's right is that right natasha nod at me if that's the case yes it's yeah. uh gail clement who's yeah. the head of research services at caltech is the developer of all the carpentry yeah. And we're interested in, I guess what we're doing is something quite similar. It's, um, but it's, it's using the same sort of approach, but applying it across a number of different specialties, not just data and software. Yeah, so just to clarify, we did actually speak with Gail um, before we, you know, while we were planning our workshop and the materials for author carpentry weren't quite ready for us to use at that point. And some of the things that were covered in creating in the author carpentry, we thought well, we probably can't cover all those things or those things are not all useful for this session. Uh, but if you Google author carpentry, it will come up. They are actually looking to, you know, that it's to looking to make it part of, it is part of the carpentry suite. Uh, so software, data, author, library, carpentry. Yeah, I was just going to add that we can't talk about carpentry without uh, mentioning Belinda Weaver and giving Belinda a really big uh, heads up there. Uh, and Belinda is currently, I'm just reading this up on LinkedIn site, building software and data carpentry communities. So her, her whole um, position now, her whole job is building those communities within Australia, if not everywhere. Uh, and I know around different institutions in Australia, Belinda's um, providing software carpentry uh, when she can, and also carpentry training, yeah. which is a different thing yeah. altogether. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, there was a yeah, question from Stephen. Just wondering if the speakers could say more about facilitating rooms of learners who are at vastly different levels of knowledge on a topic, so that non vanilla room. Yeah, Natasha, do you want to take that and then we can... Uh, 
follow up if you'd like. Yeah, I think one of the ways to do that is to ask a lot of questions and ask who has experience with this or who would like to talk about this and just try and draw out very quickly who has uh, has got experience with different things. Another way to do it, um, I was able to do this at, um, at a summer school because I, I taught a five-day course, but I allowed a slot for hot topics and I said to the class to have a look at what's being taught here and if there's anything missing then you can suggest what you might like to hear in a hot topic later on um, or if there's something you'd like to speak about nominate for a hot topic and actually got about five people nominate for a hot topic on different things and just put them up there so they get five or ten minutes to talk about their thing or however much time we had that's a way of um, drawing on the knowledge that's in the room um, another way to do it is I guess when you're moving into breakout groups as well, you can, uh, it is actually, I think it's much better to have a mix of levels, especially it, when you're doing hands-on exercises and breakout groups, because people really learn from each other there. Um, whereas if you have people all at the same level, it's actually quite a lot harder. Um, so I think it's, it's actually really good to, to, to do that. Um, so I think it's actually just drawing out through lots of questions. Uh, people generally, you know, if you say who has experience in this or who, was, who would like to talk about that, people, people generally do um, when they've got experience in that area. It's, that's, that's been my experience anyway. I don't know if you've got anything more, Ginny. Um, well, that's, I think also the idea of having the helpers in the room is really important. So, um, I mean, that's their, their role is to kind of run around and ask um, if, how people are going and having the, the, the um, having the post-it notes up on your computer, if you stuck uh, the helpers, you know, really mean that the person at the front can perhaps concentrate on actually uh, delivering what, what the, the topic, but um, having people behind who are actually able to help is really important. And in fact, that was just really, just for this particular session, you know, it was fantastic to have a really, you know, highly skilled set of folk in the room who were also able to join in and, um, and help people, made a big difference to, you know how you can just talk to um, uh, or keep the keep the whole lesson going. I I think software the carpentries might have a, a recommendation for how many people they have. But so I think it's two or three per twenty in a room or something like that. So um, it's worth just thinking about that when you're actually setting up a session like this as well. Who, who's going to help you if it's not the other speakers? Yeah, and I just wanted to mention as well that one of the things that Belinda does in the library carpentry sessions right at the start is to say, please rate your knowledge of, you know, this particular topic that we're covering around technical skills. And you sort of get post-it notes of three different colours and, you know, are you beginner, intermediate, advanced? And that's actually quite a good exercise. And I think you kind of find that there's very, very few people who rate themselves as advanced knowledge. And even Belinda puts herself in the middle there and says, I don't know much, but I'm up here and I'm happy to help and share with you what I know. And I think that that style helps to give you an idea of where people's knowledge is, is at. And it also breaks down a few barriers so people don't think, oh, I'm the only one in the room who doesn't know anything. Um, so, so that's another kind of tip that you could use. Thanks, Natasha. Um, now we don't have any questions, so maybe uh, this is a good um, spot to sort of close it down and wrap it up. And I'd just like to thank all the Brains Trust that we have here, people in the room, plus Natasha over at UQ. Uh, and thank everyone for their time. And also to thank Rachel Harrison, who is the tech person behind getting us all online. Um, and it's been, we think it's been a great session. And again, we hope we've given you the tools and resources to be able to go and deliver a session like this to people at your institution. And it doesn't have to be the full shebang. It can be, you can pick and choose which areas you would like to teach. You can even just focus on one, uh, but the resources are there and they may need a little bit of tweaking so you can take them and do that yourself. Uh, and yeah, we hope we've given you something that you can take away and use. Uh, so thank you to everyone. Thank you to Ginny, Baba, Natasha Simons, Paul Callan, Nerida Quatermas, Sandra Fry, and again, Rachel, who's sitting in her back room, making sure we're all able to be heard and seen. <laughs> okay, so thank you, everyone. And thank you to everyone for the questions too. Um, it's been a great session. Okay. Bye. Bye.